Praise the Lord. Today's message is entitled Grounded, Grounded. And I'm going to pray and then I'll lead you in a prayer. But it doesn't mean what it meant. Grounded doesn't mean for this message what it meant when I was a kid. Now, when I was a kid, when my mom said I was grounded, that meant all the fun was over. I was at home. I had to stay in my room. My friends would come to the door. Can Glenn come out to play? No, he's grounded. Did you guys use that uh, term here? Well, I don't hear it as much anymore, but the message does not mean, <laughs> it doesn't mean that. It means something else. So I'll talk about it soon. Father, I pray that you would breathe on your word. Give me grace to share it, that I would be able to break open your bread. And Father, that we would eat your word, that we would take it into ourselves and we would be transformed by it. Have your way here, Lord Jesus. Drive out all darkness and let your light come in. Let clarity come in, in the precious name of Jesus. And as we hear your word, let us be healed, let us be restored in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'll lead you in a couple action prayers. You can put your hands on your hearts, please, and pray this with me. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart and change my life in your precious name. And I like to do this. I, I saw Nikki Gumbel, I believe, do it. I, just raise your hands and, and say, come, Holy Spirit. Yeah, we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to come into this time. Amen. Amen. Today is not as much a sermon as me sharing what the Lord has been speaking to me personally. Uh, this week, we, I was just going to have a time where we share uh, with each other but I didn't give enough preparation. So I'm going to share with you what the Lord has been speaking to me personally this week. It was not prepared, especially for a sermon. It was what I was receiving from the word and I'm passing it, passing it on to you. But I think there's a there's a, quite a bit of meat here. And we'll start off with Psalm chapter 1. And if I can get Anna to, I'm going to read it from my recent translation of Psalm 1. And uh, we'll also read it later in the NIV version. We'll start off reading Psalm 1, and then at the end we'll read Psalm 4. And one of the things I've been working on is a translation of the Psalms. But it's 150 Psalms, so it takes a while. So this is the first one, and I, I, you know, like I've translated Psalm 24 and Psalm 119 and Psalm 27, all these, all these ones. Uh, but now we're just looking at the first three verses, the first three verses of Psalm 1. And I'm giving this as a handout, not so that you can read it all now, but that you can take it home and meditate on it. And then you can write in the columns of the uh, of the translation You're right in the columns and you can take notes there so let me begin Psalm chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 abundant joy marks those not walking in the wrong people's plans in the sinner's way they won't stand nor among loafers land instead Yahweh's teaching they enjoy musing day and night his guidance they employ there's an offbeat rhyme to this one. Usually it doesn't work that way, but for this one, it came out that way. Like a tree planted along branching waters, they expand, bearing fruit in season, leaves unwithering. Everything they do breaks through. Amen. So that's where, that's where we're starting today. And we start off Psalm Chapter 1, verse 1, with abundant joy marks those not walking in the wrong people's plans. Now here, when I translated this one, 
I wanted to start off with a word that had the letter A, because in the Hebrew, the first letter of the Psalms is Aleph, which is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's like our A. So I wanted to bring that out, that that's how the Psalms start. And, and uh, the first word is Ashrei, as many of you heard. And here I've translated it translated it as abundant joy. Abundant joy marks those not walking in the wrong people's plans. In the sinner's way, they won't stand nor among loafers' land. Now, why am I talking about Psalm 1? Why are we reading Psalm 1? Recently, the Lord led me back to reading a psalm a day. It's a devotional practice that I have been doing uh, for many, many years, over a decade, where I will read a psalm a day. But I took a break for a while. Of course, we were in Psalm 24, so I was reading that over and over. I took a break for a while, concentrating on other portions of Scripture, and then I went back as it started April 1st. We're in April. Could you, could you imagine? We are in April, April, April already. It's April the 7th, but April the 1st. I began to start this new cycle of going through a psalm a day. And so in 150 days, you go through a whole cycle of the psalms. And then I would start again. I've been doing this. Anna does uh, does this as well, but I stopped for a little bit so it wouldn't be monotonous and monotone, but that it would be uh, something that would be meaningful. And so when I came back to it, I found that the Psalms brought me fresh life and raised, raised me to another level. So one of my mentors, uh, I've shared this before. One of my mentors, Art Katz, when I first met him, this is, I think this is going back to 2005. I first met him, he asked me, uh, Glenn, what's your devotional practice? And I said, well, I, I try to read three chapters of the Bible and pray, and I shared some other things of what I do. And he says, I want to commend something to you, Art said to me, read a psalm a day. And so if it's the first, uh, the first of the month, you would read Psalm 1, and then you would cycle through the Psalms like that. So Art Katz, who, who's now, he's, he's with the Lord, he's um, in heaven looking down upon us. He's the one that recommended this practice to me. And I found, uh, I started doing it, and I found it very fruitful. Now, if you, look at, if you look at Psalm 1, we'll read the NIV version, Psalm 1, chapter 1. We'll just read 1 through 3 in the NIV. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Notice that word, delight. This is not... You, we don't get into the Psalms or into any scripture because it's a religious duty or we have to. What really brings life to us and raises us to another level is when the word of God is a delight to us. Our favorite meal. What's your, what's your favorite meal? What's your favorite meal? Do you like lasagna? That's good. That's good. I like lasagna too. I like cooking different, you know, meals from my hometown in New York, the things that were popular and trying to recreate, recreate the flavors because we don't have them here. So all, all that, you know, all the time I was here, I was like, oh, I wish I had my mom's cooking. Oh, I wish I had my mom's lasagna. And, uh, but only when I would go back to New York would, would I get it. And I thought, well, you know, why don't I actually learn how to cook it? So, Mom, how did you make your sauce? How did you do the meatballs? How did you do the lasagna? So I asked her, and I still have an email of where she sent me her recipe. And uh, 
And then I started to re recreate it. And so during special occasions, I'll make some of those meals. Or I made a, a pot of sauce this week <laughs> on Monday because it lasts for a while in the New York style. So there's our favorite meals that we have in the physical world. But spiritually, our favorite meal should be the word of God. We should be eating and feasting on the word of God. And it gives spiritual strength. It gives strength to our inner core. Hallelujah. So our cats recommended to me this devotional uh, practice of reading a psalm a day. And so I began to do that. And my heart was, I want a heart like David. Because the scripture says that David had a heart like God. So how am I going to have a heart like David? I'm going to need to uh, chew on what he said. I'm going to need to meditate on it day and night, as it says here, or muse on it day and night, as, as, as I have in my translation. But notice it's day and night. It's constantly, constantly uh, musing on it, constantly meditating on it well if i'm going to have a heart like david i'm going to need to eat what he was eating and to learn to pray like he was praying and so this began a, a journey for me spiritually first samuel let's read first samuel 13 14 first samuel 13 14 this is where it talks about david having a heart after God's own heart, but it doesn't mention David yet here. We know it's David by the chapters that are to come. So 1 Samuel 13, 14. This is when God takes the kingdom away from Saul because Saul did not obey. Rather, he offered sacrifices, but not in obedience. But now your kingdom will not endure. This is God speaking to Saul. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. And so the Lord sought after a man after his own heart to be the leader what we'll see is that that is David and Acts 13, 22 confirms that. I'll turn over there to Acts chapter 13, 22 and read that. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And so David had a heart after God. It's especially reflected in the Psalms. We hear his prayers and we hear his prophetic utterances. And we, we see the prayers that shaped him and they're meant to shape us as well. But there's something else I learned, something else I learned about wanting to have a heart like David. You can't have a heart like David unless you experience the enemies that David had. It's it's the opposition that makes the warrior worshiper and witness of God's glory. It's the opposition that makes the warrior worshiper and witness the witnesser of God's glory and the witness of God's glory. So if you want a heart like David, expect that family members may overlook you just like they did David. Expect a, a Saul that will persecute you and pursue you. Expect that you may have some spiritual sons like Absalom working behind your back to win disciples after themselves. Expect to have some people desert you. These experiences are part of the school of hard knocks. 
what Joseph is going through right now. <laughs> the school of hard knocks. <laughs> you will surely not need Yahweh as your refuge until storms bombard you. And God allowed a lot of storms to bombard David. And because of those storms that bombarded David, David kept on running to God as his refuge. It's a big theme in Psalms is God is, God is my refuge. So discovering and developing a heart like David happens as we read the Psalms, learn how to pray the Psalms, as well as experience the things that David's experienced. And some of that is not pretty. And it causes us to cry out to God. That's what you also hear in the Psalms. A great theme of the Psalms is this crying out to God, this need for God. So we tend to think when we get saved that everything is going to be pretty. And now that I'm saved, no troubles, no issues, no problems, no storms. God loves me so much that there'll be no hardship. But God loves us so much that he does send us hardship, but he also is our refuge in the hardship. And it's actually the hardship that causes us to draw close to him, close to his heart. So the message is named Grounded. I, I remember uh, a few years back, uh, before I, I, I heard the term, the, the term grounded or grounding is often used in wellness communities, but I'm not meaning that particularly. I'll explain what I mean soon. Uh, but I remember Daniel Mack, he took me into the front yard and he, see, he discovered this, uh, this new technique of getting well. He said, Glenn, take off your shoes, take off your shoes. Walk around in the grass, walk around in the grass. So he had me walking around and he took off his shoes, walking around the front yard in the gra uh, front yard, uh, barefooted along the grass. I thought my neighbors are gonna think I'm crazy walking around like this in the front yard. What are we doing here? He says, oh, it's helped you, you know. Electrons uh, will help you, your body. And so we were walking around there and it was quite funny. Now, today, there's a fair bit of talk about grounding. And for the wellness community, and, and those that they um, teach, it means things like lying on the ground, taking off your shoes, walking through the grass, immersing yourself in the sea, walking along the beach. These things are said to ground you. And I, I see that these are good things to, uh, to do. There's nothing wrong with walking barefoot in the grass or immersing yourself in the sea or uh, going to the beach. I like looking at the bay, you know, I'll go down to the bay or the water or beach and I like to look at the water. I would rather just look at the water. Anna likes to jump in the water. She likes to dive in and swim and I just like to look and read a book. <laughs> and not have to deal with all the changing and showering that goes on afterwards. So that's how I like to, to relax. However, I'm talking about grounding from a scriptural perspective. I'm thinking about buildings. Buildings need a foundation. They need to be grounded. Trees need roots. A tower on the rock. A tower is on the rock. It grounds it and it shelters. That tower will then form as something that will shelter us from a storm. And I don't know if, know if you saw the earthquake in Taiwan. Did you see that earthquake in Taiwan? This whole building, big building that was like the leaning tower of Pisa this week. Uh, just there, I'm, I hope everybody escaped. I don't know if the building fell down or it seemed to stay like that. And then an odd event happened this week where in New York, they had an earthquake. Well, it started out in North North New Jersey, and normally there's no earthquakes in that area of the world, but there was a strong earthquake over four point something on the Richter scale, 
And uh, everything was shaking, but New Yorkers just kept on walking. Oh yeah, just a usual day. Even though earthquakes are not usual for New Yorkers, <laughs> they just kept on going on, ordering their stuff, walking around. There's everything, they have camera footage, everything's shaking, and these guys are just going on. Because New Yorkers are built quite tough uh, <laughs> through all the things that they've, they've been through. Um, but we're talking, uh, what I'm talking about is the grounding that Jesus meant when he said, if you, if you hear my words and obey them, hear and obey, put them into practice. It's like having a foundation, not sand, but a foundation where in the storms you're not shaking, shaken. With grounding, I'm also thinking about my DJ days and setting up a sound systems, because sound systems need grounding. If you don't ground the sound system, there's going to be hums and buzzes and pops and all these sort of things will happen if you don't ground the electrical system. And you'll have noise interference, and it's very easy to get shocked if you don't ground an electrical system. So on a plug, it's the third prong that is the grounding prong on an electrical plug. So the third prong is the grounding prong. And if the system's not grounded, you can get shocked. Uh, and how the grounding happens is there's a rod, and there's, there's a rod that goes into the ground. So it takes, the, the rod that goes into the ground takes the extra electrical current and dissipates it so it doesn't just fly around and go places where it shouldn't. So the, the rod in the ground absorbs the excessive electrical charges energy and it keeps sound clean and protects you from electrical shocks like I said before. And this grounding is good. This grounding is good. I find that Psalms grounds us. The Psalms ground us. They ground us like a firm foundation. They ground us like roots. They ground us like that rod in the ground that takes the extra electrical charges they keep us from getting shocked. They keep us from all this interference and noise in our life. The Psalms ground us. So this week, I was going through Psalms and I was refining some of my translation of Psalms. And I experienced this grounding effect, especially in Psalm 4. Psalm 4. So like I said, I've been revisiting and refining my translation of Psalm 4. And my goal is that these translations are like a, a sweet smelling offering to the Lord. Now, I didn't do it to share. I didn't do the translation to share it with you this morning. I did it mainly for myself and uh, being obedient to the Lord and using it as an offering to the Lord. But... Uh, I thought it would be good to share. And I found this whole process of when you're translating or when you're meditating on the word, you're actually deeply engaged in it. And so I will read it and reread it and ponder it and meditate on it. So after reading and meditating on Psalm 4, I felt a deep sense of peace, shalom, and groundedness. I felt God's shalom and joy filling me. And, uh, and this week didn't turn out as we had hoped. We hoped it was going to be a fun week. We were going to go on day trips. Do you remember my <laughs> weekly update last week? I don't know if you read it. But we were planning to go on day trips and, and have fun. And the kids, were, kids are on uh, holidays. So, but it turned out Valerie hurt her neck. And she hurt her neck so much that she could hardly move it. It was, and she was in extreme pain. So we were taking care of her and getting her better. And thank God she's 
here this morning. And also, I knew that this week my plan is to shut myself away from Wednesday to Sunday to pray. And I'm going to be away from the family. I'm going to shut myself in the center. I'm going to, if you have, if you need prayer, let me know because I'll be praying for everybody. And I'm praying for breakthroughs and I'm praying for God to, to move. So this is something that the Lord put on my heart. I knew I was going to do that this coming week. So I was hoping that we'd have a bit of uh, re relaxation. But it turned out that my psalms were the way to peace and a happiness in all the exhaustion of life. And when I read Psalm 4, it was like I grabbed onto God's rod. His word through humanity's weakness. And just like Moses held the rod, I held that rod of Psalm 4 and it dissipated the shocking blows of life. And then I started to anticipate miracles. The Red Sea parting. Water coming from the rock. I realized that the enemy's strikes are not the last word. We can fight back. We can pray. We can call out to God in our stress. And I began to feel better but I knew that that wasn't going to be the end of life's storms, but it was a it would grounded me and, and grabbing hold of the word of God is grabbing hold of the rod like Moses grabbed hold of the rod. And that's where the miracles take place. We need to take the word and we need to lift it up, lift it up nice and nice and high. So let me read to you. A few selected portions from Psalm 4, my translation. I'm not reading the whole thing. I'm skipping parts. But let me, uh, let me start. So Psalm 4. In the stress, I cry. Answer me, my righteous God. Rescue me. Show me grace and hear my prayer. Now we're going to skip down. Just know... Yahweh treats his faithful ones with special care. He hears when I cry to him. I want to read that one again. Just know Yahweh treats his faithful ones with special care. He hears when I cry to him. Going on, be angry with humanity's vanity, but do not sin. Think deeply with your heart while on your bed. Quiet yourself, Selah. Sacrifice authentic sacrifices, not motivated by agitation. Trust in Yahweh. And I just want to stop there. Saul was offering wrong sacrifices to the Lord. That's why the kingdom was snatched from him. He was not offering authentic sacrifices. God wanted him to destroy all, all the things that he had conquered, but he was saving some, the best of it to sacrifice to the Lord, he said. But he was motivated by fear, by agitation. And so he offered wrong sacrifices. He was, he was religious. He was doing something that people would praise. Oh, look, look at Saul. He's offering all these sacrifices. He's, he's you know, giving all this to God. And, and yet it wasn't what God wanted. He wasn't obedient. He didn't have a heart after God's own heart. It was for himself. He was doing it with the wrong motivation. And here in this psalm, we read sacrifice, authentic sacrifices, not motivated by agitation. I've translated it. Trust in Yahweh. And I want to highlight that part. Trust in Yahweh. Trust in Yahweh. Then we move on. You give joy to my heart, more joy than when their grain and sweet wine abound. In shalom, peace, quietness, and satisfaction. In harmony with joy, I lie down and fall asleep. And then it concludes with, for you only, Yahweh, I trust. In you, I find my dwelling place, my true home. Sounds like what Anna was singing this morning, right? About God being our dwelling place, our true home. I'll read that one again. 
And there's a reason why I have just a few words per line, because I am trying to reflect the Hebrew poetry, which usually is three Hebrew words per line. Now, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's, often it's three, sometimes four. And so I, I want to bring out that, uh, the compactness and have you see the scriptures in a fresh way. So I'll read that last one again. For you only, Yahweh, I trust. In you I find my dwelling place, my true home. So now, in, the, in concluding, I just want to bring out three pieces of wisdom that we can draw from Psalm 4. Three nuggets of wisdom from Psalm 4. So what wisdom can we learn from Psalm chapter 4? And the first one is our response. Or my response. What's my response to stress? What's my response to the storms? How should I respond to the stress and storms? How should I react to the things that seek to suck me up into a vortex of chaos? How should I react? Well, David shows me his way. What does he do? Can you tell me? How does it start off? Yeah, crying out in the stress. In the stress, I cry. Just turning there. In the stress, I cry. Answer me, my righteous God. Release me. Show me grace. And hear my prayer. So he cries out to God. Calling Yahweh to show him grace. And hear him. And I, when I pray, I must be confident. Knowing that God has ears. God has ears. We're not praying to a chair. We're not praying to a steel beam. We're not praying to an idol. We're praying to the living God who hears. We're not praying to dead wood, a golden statue. God is real and he hears me. Prayer doesn't just change me, it changes God in some way. It affects God. Well, can God change? I'm here just throwing something out there. Prayer changes God in some way in which it affects him. It moves him. When we pray, something happens in God where he acts, where he may not act if we do not call out to him. He acts on prayer, doing what he may not have done before. I prayed or you prayed. Prayer grounds me in God. So this is the thing about prayer and the meditation on the word, how it goes together, how, how the first, you know, this is, Psalms is about worship. It's about worship. It's about praise. The Hebrew word for the book of Psalms is the word praises praises it's called the, the book of praises so it's a book about praise but the first psalm gives us that that road we go to rightly praise god and that is god's teaching yahweh's teaching yahweh's teaching we meditate on it day and night yahweh's teaching teaches us to praise it's not we don't praise god in just any way we want we praise him him according to his word. And this is why, uh, let me say that the word of God, the scripture, is the fuel to praise. Amen. It's the fuel to praise and the fuel to prayer. As soon as you stop meditating on scripture day and night, you lose that fuel. You, use that, you, you, you lose that fuel to keep on praying and praising God. Prayer grounds me in God, who is the strongest foundation. Through crying out to the Lord, I'm rooted and grounded in his love. And this is also what I mean by being grounded. What Paul was talking about in Ephesians chapter, Ephesians chapter 3, where he calls the Ephesians and he prays for the Ephesians to be rooted and grounded in love. So how am I going to be rooted and grounded in love? Well, the love that's above every other love is God's love. God's love. So how do I get rooted in that love? 
I need to be in his presence. I need to seek his face. I need to spend time with him. I need to digest his word. All of these things, when you do them, help root you in his love. And so when your roots are in his love, what are you drawing from? You're drawing from his love. So when people uh, persecute you, when people come against you, when people show up out of nowhere, hallelujah, <laughs> hey Calvin, <laughs> you have, you're drawing from love. I was like, who is that? Risen from the dead. <laughs> Good to see you, brother. <laughs> so we go through all these experiences if our roots are in his love, we're drawing from God's love. And then that is the fruit that is coming out of our life. The fruit that is coming out of our life is love. And that fruit is not a poisonous fruit. Like we were watching Alone, Alone New, New Zealand. It's a new one. Have you seen Alone? They try to survive in the wilderness. Peter, you might like that show. But they, they try to... Yushi. Yushi may be on Alone one time. <laughs> the guy is picking some berries and we're thinking are those berries poisonous what is he what is he eating what is he picking does he know what he's doing when he's picking those berries um well when you have when your roots are in love you produce the fruit of love and that fruit is not poisonous that's good fruit that's fruit that heals people's lives so when they hear your words you're restoring them, you're healing them. Uh, that word, that, that fruit is transforming. Hallelujah. So that's one of the uh, first nuggets that I draw from Psalm 4 is how I should respond to stress and pain and, and issues, whatever they may be. To cry out to the Lord, so that I'm rooted and grounded in love. Second, second nugget of wisdom is Yahweh's special care. Since I'm devoted to Yahweh, he will treat me with special care. There's a doctrine called common grace, which is a good doctrine. It means that the heavenly father cares for everyone. So he causes it to rain on the, the righteous and the unrighteous. And that means he does good to the righteous and the unrighteous. In cities, we think, oh, rain is bad, but for the farmer, the rain is good, right? He causes it to rain. He blesses the righteous and the unrighteous. This is the doctrine of common grace. But the scripture also teaches that God particularly focuses on his people, giving them an uncommon grace, giving them special care. He is particularly devoted to his people and his care goes above and beyond just the average person and that's the care that I need right now and I I think you would need it too we constantly are in need of that kind of care and I'll read to you again in Psalm 4 that line that I repeated before the the second second uh, stanza there just know oh it's not the second in your one it's the second in my one because <laughs> mine is uh, chopped up a little bit just know Yahweh treats his faithful ones with special care he hears when I cry to him amen and then the third and the last point here the third nugget is trust connects me to God Trust connects me to God. So trust connects me with Yahweh. Once I step out of the realm of trust, I start to spin out of control like a whirlwind. The devil especially wants to steal the treasure in my heart. The trust, the treasure of trust in my heart. The devil especially wants to steal the treasure of trust in my heart. He wants to take that away, knowing that if he takes that away, it's like pulling the carpet right from under me and I start to fall. He wants to steal that, tre uh, that treasure that the father is good. The father is good. The father is good to us. 
Now the devil will cause a lot of attacks, a lot of problems to get us to think that the father is not good, but re realize it's the devil that's not good. He's the one that is trying to rob, kill, and destroy. He's the one that's trying to break down our life. He's the one that's firing at our house, our tower. Um, and then he wants to get it all mixed up in our head where we start thinking God is bad. And maybe we don't think much about the devil, but God is bad. He's looked at all these bad things that are happening to me. And so one of the enemy's aims is to get us to, to pull out of our hearts that statement of truth that the father is good. The father is good. And the other, the other week, a couple of weeks ago, a few of you knew about and were praying for me. I was finding a hard time coping. And I was uh, yelling, screaming, praying. I was by myself. Um, but then Anna, Anna went and called Daniel and Diane. So we need to pray for, for Glenn. And what was happening with me, I just... So many, so many difficulties that I was just breaking. And uh, Anna prayed for me, Daniel and Diane prayed for me, and I was able to bounce back quick. But I, what, what caused me to start to spin out of control in my mind, I wasn't like hurting anybody, but it was a, it was a bit scary for myself. And uh, what started me spinning out of control was I as I look back about look back on it I was thinking I started to believe that God is not good I started to believe that the father is not good he's not taking special care of me he, he dislikes me for some reason uh, even though I'm being obedient to him and doing everything that he's calling me to and so I'm angry God what is going on I'm doing it but but it wasn't the type of wrestling and prayer that I was talking about, it started to get more into the, uh, you know, me starting to get really uh, upset, really upset. And, um, and, I, and then the Lord started to unravel the enemies trying to trick you. We, we can also think that the Father is abstractly good or theoretically good or theologically good, but not practically good to me. And I need to know from, and I, and I get this grounding through the Psalms, I need to know that the God is practically good to me. He is practically good to me. He, he's going to uh, care for me and look after. I'm not just thinking of me. I'm thinking, when I'm saying me, I'm thinking of my whole family because this is what I'm concerned about. Most of all, in all of you. Uh, so I need to know that the... God is practically good to our church. God is practically good to our ministry. God is practically good to my family. We all need to know that. If God fed Elijah through a raven, God can send a brother or sister to bring provision when we're in need. And he's done that many times through, many times through God's people. Just like this bird just flew in now. It's, you don't know where it's going to come from. But this stealthy raven, well, just like it came to Elijah with food, just flies out of nowhere, comes and drops something into our lap. I remember one particular instance where is when Valerie was born. Now, Valerie is almost 11. She's 10 years old. But we were uh, about two weeks till she was going to be born, and we had nothing for her, nothing, you know, like, when you're going to give birth to a baby, you would want everything. You want the crib, you want the baby stuff, everything ready. But we had nothing for her. And we had, because we didn't know we were going to have another kid, so we get everything from Gideon, Allison, and Eva, we had given away. So we're like, what are we going to do? And as a father, you know, I felt like, am I providing this and that? And I was crying out to God, but we were just were in a very difficult situation at that time and nobody really knew about it and then all of a sudden out of nowhere pastor miguel from the spanish church comes knocking on the door 
And he has this huge collection of baby stuff that their church took up this offering for us. Have all the things we needed, uh, from, you know, diapers to, you know, what was it, a, a, a crib? And I, I, I just knew everything that we needed was there. And it was like that raven came, flew in, dropped this off, and we praise God for it. And that's just one instant. Yeah, that's just one instance. Yes, Anna? Gideon came up and just said, Anna was crying. I'm saying this for those who couldn't hear. <laughs> so, yeah, amen. Was, just trust God. God will provide. Gideon said he was young then. And, and then, yeah, like a raven, they came. And this has happened many times. And you guys also have been like ravens in our life coming here and, and there so many times it's happened and so it's good for us to reflect on those times where God has been good to us what God has provided for us in ways that are surprising and unique yeah he had this mega store of supplies for the baby trust causes me to lie down and rest when I'm not trusting I'm stressed out but and there is a time to be stressed and you cry out to God. But then we have that confidence that the Lord is hearing. Trust causes me to lie down and rest. Trust moves me to find my joy and shalom in Yahweh, who is my dwelling place, my true home. This is what trust does. It causes us to run into his home. Amen. 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 So that's my little offering to you. To, to the Lord and to you this morning. You can take that uh, handout and you can use that for prayer and meditation. And I want to encourage you to try out. Uh, give, it, give it a go. Uh, reading a psalm a day and meditating on it. Now next week, now next week I'm with, we're going to have communion. We didn't have communion this week. I'm hoping to have a time where we can each share Share testimonies, share portions of scripture, share reflections, share encouragement. So come next week with something to share. Um, thank you, and I will pray. Father, we want to thank you for the Psalms you've given us this gift. And this gift causes our, our roots to go down deep into your love. It causes us to be grounded, to be renewed and refreshed and raised higher. And I, I pray for us as a congregation that we would find wisdom and love and grace in the Psalms and that you would develop in us that heart like David, develop in all of us that heart like David, Lord, and that our church would be a church with a heart like David. We want to have a heart like you. That's why we're praying that we don't want to be like Martha running around here and there busy and worried about so many things. But we want to be like Mary who sits at your feet, drinks in your word, puts you first. So thank you for this treasure trove of the Psalms and all that you have. Bless our meditation in Psalms. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How about we end with a, a song of worship? <laughs> Anna's, Anna needs a tissue. <laughs> well, now I can have my coffee. I didn't.